The first chapter we're gonna start with is uh, chemical equilibrium. Uh, chemical equilibrium really deals with a certain type of reaction. And that type of reaction is a reversible reaction. And perhaps you're familiar with that reaction. If I can find that thing on here. So reversible reactions have reactants that go to products. And what makes it a reversible reaction, and you may be familiar with this, maybe you remember talking about electrolytes. Electrolytes, which are weak electrolytes, have the arrows that basically head in both direction. And that means that this type of reaction is a reversible reaction. And when we talk about reversible reactions, it basically means that there are two directions. There is what is considered the forward direction, which is heading from reactants to products. And then there is the reverse direction, which heads from products back to reactant. So in a reversible reaction, typically speaking, in a lot of cases, we start out with our reactants and pretty much at the beginning of the reaction, it's pretty much all the forward reaction. So all of our reactants are coming together. They're coming together to form products. At some point, we will build up enough products on our product side, obviously there and stuff that's been formed that they will decide to also sort of recombine and start heading in the opposite direction. And we get this sort of forward and reverse direction that occurs uh, in this type of reaction. Now, sometimes when people think about chemical equilibrium, they have a misunderstanding of sort of what that means. A lot of times people think, oh, well, that means equilibrium, everybody is equal. And that's really not the case here. What it really means when we talk about a reaction that is reached chemical equilibrium is it is actually about the rate. And it is the rate of the forward direction will equal the rate of the reverse direction. So just as fast as we start to make products at some point, those products will recombine basically and head back in the other direction. And what that essentially does is it locks everybody into pretty much where they're at at that point. So when a reaction reaches equilibrium, wherever everybody's at on the reactant side, on the product side, they essentially get locked into place because just as fast as it goes this way, it's gonna just as fast go back the other way, leaving everybody pretty much not going to change where their concentrations are. Again, it doesn't mean that I got like, you know, four molar on this side and four molar on that side equal amount. Just means just as fast as it goes one way, it will go the other way. And that will essentially lock everybody into place. Like I said, any questions on that there? <clears throat> Thank you. So when we look at equilibrium and chemical equilibrium, again, really what we're looking at is the rate, which if you remember maybe from 200A, that is kinetics, yes. So that's how fast or slow sort of the reaction is occurring. But when we do reach that, pretty much the equilibrium state, everybody gets locked into their concentrations and they essentially will remain in those concentrations unless you do something to kind of screw up the equilibrium. But if you don't do anything to screw up the equilibrium, they pretty much will maintain where they're at when it reaches that. Now, if you were to look at a reaction, for example, and you looked at like the beaker, we'll just go with red, so we got red. <laughs> Boom, it like turned from colorless to red. And you may look at it and go, yeah, looks done, it's red, right? You know, not much happening at that point. And if this was a reversible reaction on sort of the molecular level, you know, it will look like it's pretty much done. But if you sort of zoomed in to, uh, sorry, I misspoke, on the bigger side there, it will look like it's done on the molecular level. If you zoomed in there, you would see a lot of activity. You basically would see reactants going to products, products coming back to reactants. So a lot is going on there, even though visually, if you kind of look at the beaker, it looks like everything's done. 
but there is a lot of activity that occurs when a reaction reaches equilibrium. <clears throat> so as I mentioned on the macroscopic level, it does look very static, but definitely a lot going on uh, when it does reach that equilibrium. So if we look at a reaction and this reaction is basically the formation of ammonia H2 plus some N2. Going to make our NH3 here. Maybe a little balancing would be good since it's chemistry, I suppose. There we go. All right. So at the very beginning of this reaction, sort of at time zero, if we were just starting this reaction, it's pretty much all our H2 and N2 that's basically happening. And we can see that here at time zero, we got a lot of H2. Time zero, we got some N2. And we pretty much have zero of this guy basically to begin with, no products as you can see here. So as I mentioned before, you know, when we have sort of a reversible reaction, that forward direction will kick off. So clearly as that forward direction kicks off, we are going to start making some NH3, which is what we see on this curve, right? We start to see an increase happening here, which are NH3. In order to do that, we have to use up some of our reactants. So that is why we start to see obviously a decrease in our reactants as this reaction begins. At some point, it will reach chemical equilibrium. And like I said before, that's pretty much where everybody gets sort of locked into place in terms of where they are, in terms of their concentrations, maybe pressures if you're dealing with some type of gas. And you could clearly see that is pretty much where all three of these lines in this particular example basically plateaus. They all basically flatten out, which means their concentrations are not changing with time. They pretty much have leveled out. They're going to maintain those concentrations throughout the whole thing. So where that dotted line sort of is, is when a chemical equilibrium basically has been reached. And again, that would be the point where the rate of that forward reaction will equal that rate of that reverse reaction at that particular point. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so initially, as we see here in this particular reaction, uh, we initially have no products. Again, we will start that sort of forward direction as we really start to build up enough or really a sufficient amount of our products, that is really when we will see that reverse direction really start to kick in and start heading in the opposite way until again, everybody sort of locks into place in terms of their concentrations. <clears throat> And again, if you ever look at sort of a reaction rate versus time graph, and you're asked like, where did equilibrium occur? You're pretty much looking for a very badly drawn straight line like that, a plateau line. Um, and that's basically the point where we do reach that equilibrium. Again, as we saw there with the example of the ammonia, when we did reach equilibrium, we did not have the same amounts of everybody, right? Everybody has some of their different concentrations. And again, that's a really important thing to remember when we talk about equilibrium. <clears throat> All right, so take a second here and think about this. If we have this particular reaction here, which is a reversible reaction, if we decided to add some more H2O to the flask, how will the concentrations of each of these guys, each of the species there, change based off of their original concentration? So take a second, think about, you know, would we have more? Would we have less? Would we have the same amount of everybody? So let's talk about it here. What do you think? Um, if I add H2O, why don't we start with H2? What will happen to its concentration? Should it go up? Should it go down? Should it stay the same? It should go up again. When we add more water, which is over here, that's a reactant, right? And for a reaction basically take place, things that help with rates is more reactants, right? More guys floating around, greater chance they're gonna collide with each other, greater chance the reaction is gonna kick off. 
So really by doing this, what we're forcing this equilibrium reaction to do is for the meantime, kind of head in this direction, right? And kind of do that forward direction, which would be favored in this case because of that increase in our reactant concentration. That would also mean, obviously here for CO2, we should expect it to increase as well, right? We should expect both products to be formed. So we should see an increase happening here in our CO2. How about our CO? What will happen with our CO? CO should stay the same, go up, go down. So one out of three shot, 33 and a third percent. What do you think? It should go down, right? In order to actually make the products, we need both reactives, right? To actually combine. So because we need both reactives, we should definitely see a decrease happening there with our CO. Now, how about the water itself? What will happen with water? Well, actually what will happen here is a couple of things. And some of it is sort of artificial because of what you did. Because we added more H2O, we should initially see the concentration go up just because we added it, right? So you kind of artificially did that. But once it starts reacting, we then should see it start to come back down. So you might actually, in this particular example, end up with a little more water than you started with, only really because you artificially sort of added it. But the trend that you would see is obviously it would increase because you added it. As it starts to react, it should come back down. And again, may actually end up a little bit higher than where it started. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Yeah. The CO went down in order to make products in a reaction, right? So in order to make products, pretty much all your reactants, they basically break apart, right? Which means you need both of these reactants here to basically break all their bonds so that they can reassemble on the other side, right? And when they reassemble on their side, that's gonna require some CO to be used. So when you have a reaction, pretty much both reactants, all the reactants are going to react with each other, which means you would expect their concentrations to go down. Otherwise, if the CO didn't go down, you would have no way to make CO2, right? You gotta kind of free up some carbon there to make some new bonds and stuff like that. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so take a second here. Let's talk about if we instead added H2 to the flask, what will happen to everybody's concentrations? All right, so this one will be kind of similar. So if we add H2, which is actually over here on our product side, that should really kick off what reaction, the forward or the reverse reaction? it should really kick off the reverse reaction, right? So we should kind of kick off that reverse reaction happening. Again, really for the same reason, we just kind of added a lot more products, which means it's gonna be easier for them to find each other, it's gonna be easier for them to start reacting and our, pro our reactants are going to start being formed. The result of that is much like we saw on the previous example here, we should expect both of those concentrations to start to increase, right? So they should start to increase as we are basically having the forward, uh, sorry, the reverse reaction happening. Now our CO2, just like before, should do what? In this case, it will go, it will decrease again, just like sort of the reactants, both of them are needed to make products. If we're heading in the reverse direction, same deal happens. You need both products in this case to make the reactants that we have. So you need both of them and we would expect it to go down kind of a similar sort of deal for our H2 here that we saw uh, with the last one. Because we really added it, we will see that initial bump up as the reverse direction or reaction really starts to take place. We will see it start to, again, sort of crawl back down. And then depending on how much you added, again, you may end up actually higher than what you started with. Any questions on any of those things there? <clears throat> All right, so we looked at that, I think. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the equilibrium constant and sort of its application. 
So in a reversible reaction such as this, we can really write an expression that's what is referred to as the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant is capital K here. It is basically the letter of the class. Like we're on Sesame Street, this class is brought to you by the letter K. We're gonna learn about every single K you'd never want to know about in this class. And then maybe some more, I don't know at that point. But basically there is a relationship that if we, for example, in this reaction on the top, if we take the concentration of NO2 squared divided by the concentration of N2O4, by the way, in case you're not familiar, when we have brackets like this, that means concentration. And typically concentration is our good friend molarity. What is molarity? Molarity is, it is big M. What does it stand for? What, how do you calculate molarity? Yeah, it is moles over liters, right? So it is moles over liters. Um, so that is basically what we see there when we see those brackets. Again, means concentration, means molarity. <clears throat> The number not important here, but we do for this particular reaction have an equilibrium constant, uh, which is 4.63 times 10 to the minus three. In general, the way that you calculate the equilibrium constant is for like a generic reaction here, you basically take the concentration of all the products divided by the concentration of all the reactants, and you do use the balance coefficients there as the exponents. So we do use those guys as the exponents. So obviously you want to make sure the equation is balanced. Not too much of a problem usually in our class here. I mean, a lot of ones you see are pretty much balanced, but we do use the coefficients as the exponents when we do that. So essentially speaking, when you calculate K, it is the concentration of our products divided by the concentration of our reactants. When we calculate K like this, where we use concentrations, it is also sometimes referred to as KC. I'm just gonna take a guess to see means concentration there. Yeah, so that is basically the equilibrium constant uh, calculated using concentrations. Now, this value is an equilibrium constant which means it is a constant value, which means for a particular reaction, like the one that we see on top, no matter what you do to it, when it reaches equilibrium and you calculate the equilibrium constant, it will always be that number. It doesn't matter if you start out with all reactants, no products. It doesn't matter if you start out with some reactants and some products and you throw some in. It doesn't matter if you start out with all products long as you do not change the temperature, that value will be constant. So the only thing that will basically affect the actual value of the equilibrium constant is if you change the temperature. And what that means is if you change the temperature, let's just say we did it at two different temperatures, say 25 degrees and say 50 degrees Celsius, as long as you keep that reaction at 25 degrees Celsius, you can start with as much reactants, product, combination, different amounts, it will always hit that number. If you then change it to 50 degrees and keep the reaction at 50 degrees, and again, do the reaction for as much reactants, products, whatever you want there, it will remain the same at 50 degrees. The difference is the equilibrium constant value comparing 25 degrees and 50 degrees will give you a different equilibrium constant. So it's not like you change the temperature and get a whole bunch of different ones. When you change the temperature, you can calculate the equilibrium constant for that temperature and it will maintain the same, but it will be different than the other temperature that you went from. Question on that? <clears throat> That's also a very hard concept for a lot of people to sort of understand and then you just think about it like, wait, I dumped in 20 milliliters of the first reactant and 20 milliliters of the second reactant. And then for the next experiment, 
I did like five milliliters and 20 milliliters, but I got the same equilibrium constant. And it doesn't really matter. Again, you can start anywhere along the way in an equilibrium process. It will always come together when it reaches equilibrium at the same ratio of products to reactants, as long as you don't change the temperature. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Other kind of nice thing, I guess, about the equilibrium constant is after probably they beat into your head, put units on everything, units on everything. It's actually just a number. There's like no units usually involved in the equilibrium constant. It is just actually a number. So what does that number sort of represent? What would you think if I had a equilibrium constant value that was large? When I reach equilibrium, would I mainly have reactants or products? are equal amounts if I had a large equilibrium constant value. You would have mostly products. Simple math, right? If it's products divided by reactants, in order to get a large number, you need more products on top, right? Divided by less reactants. So you would have more products when it reaches equilibrium. And obviously the opposite would be true if we had a small value of K. In order to calculate a small value K, we would need less products on top divided by more reactants on the bottom. When it reaches equilibrium, you would mainly expect to have more reactants present. <clears throat> Any questions on, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so as we go through all these different sort of equilibrium constant values, we will run across some that are typically really large numbers, and we'll run across some that are typically really small numbers. So to answer your question, if you have a, a reversible reaction that has a, a pretty large value of K, you know, for the most part, it almost is like a one-way street, like it's all going to kind of head towards the product side, you know, there, but there is still a little bit that will come back the other way. And that's why it's still a reversible reaction. But there definitely is some reactions where the equilibrium constant is so large, you know, you can almost consider it like it's all going that way. But because of the nature of that type of reaction, even though it's all almost 100% going towards product side, you'll have just a minuscule amount kind of heading back the other way. And you'll still have a very small amount of reactants there. You may calculate it maybe something like you know times 10 to the minus 18 molar left which is essentially nothing but technically speaking you know there's still a smidge of it left over yeah and the same thing if it was a very very small value of k that means essentially it ain't going toward the product side you know it's, it's pretty much going to all kind of stay there in the reactants if you make products it's going to be super small amount that would be made other questions <clears throat> Here's some other letters in case you don't like A, B, C, and D. You could use those for the, for the top part there. Now, what is a really large value for K? What is a really sort of small value for K? Well, we use the big number of one. So anything that is above one or above is considered a large value of K. Anything that is technically less than one is considered a small value of K. And obviously there's degrees of that. I mean, you could have an equilibrium constant that's like five or one point something. You could have an equilibrium constant that is like one times 10 to the 20, which is way, way larger. So there are degrees obviously of that. Um, just like you could have, you know, an equilibrium constant that's like 0.1 versus one times 10 to the minus 36, right? Which is a very, very different uh, sort of value. So anything technically above one is considered large in the equilibrium. Anything less than one. So if you see like a negative exponent on scientific notation for an equilibrium constant, you know, you consider it a small value. And obviously if it's sort of a larger than one, it will be a large value. If you got something around one, you probably got a, a good shot of having around equal amounts of both those guys. Obviously math wise, that's the only way you would kind of get around one would be have about the equal amounts of reactants and products. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if they both, uh, so for example, if you're asking if you had, say, two products and they both had coefficients, you would include them for both of them. You, you, you want to add them together. So, you know, uh, like, for example, let's take a look at that one that we had there. It was uh, H2 plus N2, 3 NH3, right? It's 2 NH3. And a three over here. So if we were to write the equilibrium expression for this, it would be K is equal to the concentration of NH3. And we would take the two because of the coefficient that's there. We would divide it then by the concentration of H2. That would be to the third power there because of the coefficient. In this case, his coefficient is one. So we would not put a coefficient there. It's assumed obviously two be one so it looks something like that is that your question yeah so you don't you don't definitely don't like add these coefficients or anything like that but they stay with the element or whatever the molecule may be other questions <clears throat> all right so here if we have this reaction mickey reacts with these guys and then mickey gets upside down and the k value here is 25 when we reach equilibrium, would we expect mainly reactants or products should be there? It should be products. Again, a value of 25 is considered a large value, uh, which means we definitely should expect products to be there. Again, we will still have reactants, um, but we definitely should have more products than uh, what we started with or where we have started. Now let's talk a little bit about homogeneous equilibrium. Uh, homogeneous equilibrium, much like a homogeneous mixture means that everything mixes, everything's the same throughout. It's the same idea here. In a homogeneous equilibrium, it means everybody's in the same phase. So in this particular case, everybody is in the gas phase. <clears throat> And we can write our Kc value like we talked about, taking the concentration of NO2 squared in this case, divided by the concentration of N2O4. And again, much like in chemistry, we don't write the one. So obviously it's to the first power there, but we do not include it. And since we're doing uh, concentrations here, that is what is referred to as the Kc. But when we think about our good friend gases, we oftentimes think about what with that? pressure, right? So when we're dealing with gases, we oftentimes deal with pressure. By the way, that is like uh, PV equals what? NRT, yeah, ideal gas law. Pressure should be in atmospheres. Volume should be in liters. N is moles, right? And T is temperature should be in Kelvin. And R is the gas constant. 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere, Kelvin mole. So we can actually write an equilibrium expression that actually doesn't deal with concentrations, but does deal with pressures, which might actually be the case of what you're looking at. And it works really the same way. It is called a Kp value, P obviously meaning pressure, and it works the same way, it's still products over reactants. You still use the coefficients as the exponents. The only difference is this is the partial pressure. So that would be the partial pressure of NO2 squared because of the coefficient up here on top. And on the bottom would be divided by the partial pressure of N2O4. Clearly here, we'd probably want to use atmospheres. Yes, common unit. Just in general, in equilibrium problems, if you're dealing with gases, and later on when we talk about sort of uh, calculating something like equilibrium pressures and stuff like that, you know, atmospheres is definitely the way to go in terms of units. Yes, one atmosphere is how many millimeters of mercury? Seven. Got very quiet. Sixty <laughs> millimeters of mercury. Yes. Also, seven hundred and sixty. Tor, yeah. So we'll come across some problems, or you might come across some problems a little later on in this chapter where you know it is sometimes tricky, 
because the problem itself will give you some pressures in like millimeters of mercury or tor, and they'll ask for like the answer in millimeters and tor. But kind of when you do the equilibrium calculation, as we'll talk about later on, it's got to be an atmosphere. So in those types of situations, just keep in mind, it's probably a good idea to convert it to atmospheres, do the equilibrium calculation, and then you got to convert it at the end of the calculation. So that's a very common sort of thing. Does the value of KP and KC equal each other? And the answer is no, they don't numerically equal the same value. I won't say in most cases they don't, uh, but they do tell you the same thing. So just like KC, if you have a large value for KC, that means you should mainly have products. And if you have a large value for KP, that means you should mainly have a lot more products. And that would make sense in this because if you have more products, you probably have more gas products. More gas products are probably creating more pressure, right? Because they're flying around, causing collisions. And that's why you have a larger KP value. Vice versa as well. Again, if you have a small KP value, that means you probably got more reactant gas molecules flying around, which means it probably has a lot more pressure on the reactant side and <clears throat> causing your KP value to be lower. Now there is a relationship. In some cases you might want a KP value or a KC value, but maybe you're only given uh, pressures. So the only thing you could kind of directly calculate is the KP value. So there is a way to sort of cross over to go from KP to KC. And it's this equation here. The KP value will equal the KC value times RT delta N, where delta N is the change in the number of moles of gas molecules. R is our gas constant, which is up there on the top left. T is our temperature, which should be in kelvins, like any gas sort of thing. So temperature should be in kelvin. And this is a really nice way that you could kind of go from KP value to KC value uh, relatively easy. The delta N part is really important that you actually do it correctly. So what I mean by that is, let's say we had 2A, which is a gas, goes to B, which is a gas. What would delta N equal? How do I count gas molecules in the balance equation? Any ideas? What would tell me how many gas molecules are there in the equation for each of them? It's the coefficient, yeah? You simply got to count the coefficient for anybody that has a G next to it, right? So on the reactive side, there's two gas molecules. On the product side, there is one, which means delta N is, it is negative one because it is one minus two, which is negative one. Now you might not think that's a big difference, you know, and just go, hey, the difference is one. <clears throat> but mathematically speaking, if we look at the equation there of KP equals KC RT to the first power, that's a very bad one, R to the minus one, is there a difference in math of how you solve that? There is a difference in math, right? One is like nothing, right? Minus one means you take one over that number, right? So there very is a really big difference. It's a very common mistake that people make. They just go, I'll just get the difference and not worry about the negative sign. You wanna make sure that you do worry about the negative sign because mathematically speaking, when you put it into that equation there in the box, it will make a big difference in the value that you get uh, when you calculate it. Any questions on that? <clears throat> By the way, just a reminder, you are responsible for formulas. So I'm assuming that guy in the box would be the one you would want to know, right? So remember, formulas will not be provided for you. You have to sort of know this. All right, so again, in this case, as you see on the bottom there, we do want to take the products minus the reactants. Obviously, in order to do a KP sort of expression, you need gas molecules, right? So you pretty much need gas molecules to do that. Um, 
in most cases, it'll either be, all be gas molecules in order to do a KP, or you might have a combination of gas molecules and solids, which we'll talk about, or liquids, which we'll talk why that will work as well. <clears throat> Now, when we look at this uh, reaction here, which by the way, this is, anybody know what this is? It's acetic acid, yeah. If you don't know what that is, by the end of this class, you'll see it every two seconds. It's, it's like everybody's favorite one to use for example, is acetic acid. By the way, also sometimes we're in C2H4O2, same thing, yeah. Uh, plus some water, make some acetate and a little bit of hydronium ion on the right hand side there. Now we can write the equilibrium constant like we did before, which is simply just taking our products over our reactants. Now, something like water, which is a pure liquid, pretty much remains constant throughout the reaction. Its concentration really doesn't change. Uh, pretty much all that much at all. And because of that, we typically do not include water in the equilibrium expression. So if we were to write the actual equilibrium expression for this equation, it will actually be this one here I'm gonna box. And it would actually be our products over our reactant, not including water. And as we'll talk about, and I'll jump the gun a little bit here, but we'll talk about it Pretty much there are two things not included in the K value or the K expression. And the two things that are not included in the K expression are anybody that pretty much has a liquid next to it. Things that are in the liquid state are pure substances. They have pretty high concentrations and they remain relatively constant throughout the process. If you just think about solutions in general, most solutions are water-based, right? So there's water all over the place, right? So in addition to just the pure water that's there, there is water in all those guys that say aqueous next to it, right? That's what aqueous means. It means something that's a water environment, something dissolved in something like water. <clears throat> or the other thing that we do not include, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, is things that are solid. Things that are solid, as we'll talk about, is pretty much like this thing. It's just sitting there, not doing much, right? Like if you toss a rock into a, a glass carefully, I suppose, it's going to sink to the bottom and not really do much. Unless you toss it hard, then it'll break the glass. But you know, if you put it in there gently, uh, it hopefully won't do too much to it. All right. So again, the equilibrium constant for this one should just be what's in the box. This is just telling you that we're multiplying out the constant water, so we don't need it. Now, in practice, as I mentioned, we typically don't include any units uh, for the equilibrium constant. It is just a number. And again, that number does give us a lot of information about the reaction we're looking at in terms of you know, what we should expect to have there at the end of it, reactives are products. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? All right, take a second here. Sorry, the arrows got all out of place here. So we'll go that way. We'll pop them back in where they go. Write the KC and KP if possible for each of these. Okay, let's take a look. So for the first one here, if we're going to write our KC, remember it is product of reactants. So we would go with our KC is the concentration of NO2, and we would want to take it to the fourth power, again, because of the coefficient there. That would be multiplied by our O2, which is coefficient obviously is one, so we don't need to put it. That would then be divided by a reactant, which is our N2O, which does need to be squared. Any questions on that one? Can I write a KP for that first one? I can because they're all gases, so that's no problem. Again, pretty much identical, except that it is the partial pressure of NO2 to the fourth times the partial pressure of O2 divided by partial pressure of N2O, also squared in this case. <clears throat> Questions on either? Yeah. Is 
is it is there any reason why it's oh uh, no there's no real reason uh usually because uh because it's the p it sort of gets like the more of the capital and you know you almost write like the no2 when you're doing like for kp as almost like a subscript and the the exponent as like a superscript it's just because the other way we don't do that because obviously we're putting it between the brackets and stuff but it's not technically wrong if you kind of write the p and the no2 kind of uh the same um but people usually will write it slightly different so they don't run together people go what's like p no2 you know and, you know so they understand there's sort of a partial pressure other questions yeah If your question is, if we wanted to calculate delta n for the first reaction, is that your question? Yeah. So we do just what we talked about. We want to do delta n, which should be the number of gas molecules on our product side. So how many do we have on our product side? Well, this is a gas molecules here, and there's four of them. This is also a gas molecule, and that's one. That's actually five. Yeah. So just add up the coefficient. And over here, there is two. So it'd be like five minus two the answer would be three there in that case uh, other questions on that <clears throat> yeah why did i not put i'm sorry this square oh i'm sorry i just missed it i'm just getting old thank you <laughs> it should be there thank you yeah, there is a five there. Yeah. Other questions or was that it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, you're getting old. Sometimes stuff right in front of you, you can't see it. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the second one. Our KC for this one should be um, our product, which would be H3O plus times F minus divided by our HF. Do I include our water? I don't, again, it's a pure liquid, uh, so we're not going to include that in there. Can I write a KP for the bottom one? I can't, there's like no gas to be found anywhere. So no gas means there should be technically kind of no pressure associated with it, which means obviously you can't write the KP value. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, pretty much uh, those are the two. So aqueous and gas are included. Everybody else pretty much not yet. Yeah. Uh, there's no, no gases here. So the KP is based off of partial pressures. In order to have partial pressures, you got to have some gas molecules flying around and banging it into things, right? So uh, without those guys flying around, then you can't include them. So yeah, good point. Uh, it is basically your aqueous and your gas are going to always be included. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, here, I think it was just asking about how to calculate. You could put it into, for example, if you had a value for either one of these, you know, KC or KP, if you actually had a value, you're able to calculate it. You can put it into that equation that we saw there in the box and use that delta N for that equation. All right, so why don't we try one here with some numbers and perhaps that formula in the box. The equilibrium concentrations for the reaction between carbon monoxide and molecular chlorine uh, at 74 degrees, our CO is 0 0.012, Cl2 is 0 0.054, and our CO, Cl2 is 0.14. We wanna calculate both things here. We wanna calculate the Kc value and the KP value. So take a few minutes, see what you come up with, and then we'll go through it. So again, think about that form that we saw just a second ago on the other slide. All right, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So clearly in this case, we're looking for KC or KP. Uh, we're given some concentrations here at equilibrium. It wouldn't make sense to calculate which one? The KC, since you have the concentrations, no way to really calculate KP, you know, with what's given to us. So we could start with our expression, which in this case would be our KC 
would be the concentration of our product, our COCl2, divided by our CO and our Cl2. Obviously, we have all these guys which are equilibrium uh, concentrations. Otherwise, by the way, you can't go into the equilibrium constant, right, if they're not equilibrium concentrations. Uh, so we will put that in here. Our Kc will equal our, it looks like 0 0.14 divided by our CO, which is 0 0.012. And our 0 0.054 looks like. And if we do all that good stuff there, lays us up about a 216, which really should probably be like a 220. Yeah, if we're still looking at sig figs like this is a chemistry class, I mean, that's, uh, it's like all twos there, right? <clears throat> First off, any questions on that calculation there? So we can now use that formula that we had uh, in the previous slide, which is our KP is equal to our KC, RT delta N, in this case, we want to calculate delta N. On the product side, there's how many gas molecules? One. Reactant side, there is, there is two. One here and one here. So that is two, which means our delta N there is negative one. We do also need to take our temperature here and convert it to Kelvin. And to do that, we add 273, I think, still. And that gives us a 347 in terms of our Kelvin. That's pretty much everything we need here. So we go in with our 220, our 0 0.08206. If you want to use 0 0.0821, it's fine. It's just the number I have beat in my head. So if you like the 0 0.0821, that's all good, too. And... Uh, we're going to go with our 347, and we want to make sure we multiply first and then take basically to the minus one, which is basically one over that answer. So we're going to go 0 0.08206 times 347. We're then going to basically take one divided by that number. And then we're gonna multiply it. I'll go with the 220 there. And that's gonna give us a KP value here, 7.7. .7. Questions on those calculations. <clears throat> we see here what we've been talking about, the value of KC and the value of KP are different. They are both large or small values. They're both large, even the guy on the bottom, which is 7.7, .7, that's above one. So it's still considered large. And obviously 220 is considered large as well. That means when this thing reaches equilibrium, we should mainly expect to have products there. Yeah, which is what we see with the concentration of our product at 0.14 versus our other guys. Yeah. There are no units associated with K, yeah. So <laughs> unless you find a weird person, I'll say, no, I don't know, I would say weird, but Typically speaking, no, nothing, nothing in terms of units with K, which is really why I just ditched the units there in the calculation because you don't really need them, nor do you really need them here. So if you are calculating a K value, don't need units. But with that being said, you may not always be calculating a K value. You may be calculating something like a concentration, which probably should have molarity in terms of units, right? Or you may be calculating something like a pressure, which also should have maybe something like atmospheres in terms of units. So. You know, but definitely in case, pretty much just numbers, uh, no units associated. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. All right, let's try another one here where we're actually looking for an equilibrium pressure, I believe. And uh, what is the equilibrium pressure of O2 if the NO concentration is, our pressure is 0.4 atmospheres? And the NO is, so one of those is wrong. So I'm gonna take a pick here. I don't remember which one's which. So let's just go with, 
Let's go with the first one here as NO2. Why not? Oops. If it writes, maybe. There we go. We'll do that guy as NO2. <clears throat> Otherwise, it'll probably make it harder, I suppose. All right, take a minute or two there, or a few minutes, and see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look and see how we're doing. So clearly, uh, we're given a KP. Uh, we got some pressures given to us, equilibrium pressures. We're looking for an equilibrium pressure. So good place to start would be with the KP expression. So in this case, our uh, KP should equal the partial pressure of NO, and that should be squared, times the partial pressure of O2, divided by the partial pressure of our NO2, and that would be squared, and that equals us 158. In this case, we have NO2 and NO. Hopefully I picked right, I suppose. So we can rearrange or we can plug them in whatever way you like to do it or comfortable doing it. So basically uh, 0 0.27, that does need to be squared times the partial pressure of O2 divided by our 0 0.4, which also needs to be squared. And that's gonna equal 158. Math-wise, right, we're going to multiply that to that side, come back and then divide the guy that's on top to the other side, right? So uh, if we do all that, we take uh, 158 times 0.4 squared divided by 0.27 squared. Gets us 300 and we'll call it 47. Do I need units on this one? The answer is yes, because we're looking for a partial pressure. The units would obviously be the same units as everybody else here. And that would be our atmospheres. Question on that calculation there. The KP value here, small or large? which means we would expect mainly to have, and we can see by the pressures here that most of the pressure is definitely from the product side with that oxygen bouncing around and causing a lot of pressure in. And that's probably due to obviously having more products there at equilibrium. Any questions on any of that? <clears throat> now, heterogeneous equilibrium, much like our heterogeneous mixture, is one where we have basically everybody in different phases. And here we can see we have solids and we have gases. So as I sort of jumped a couple of slides back, in addition to things that are pure liquids, um, things that are solid as well, really will not interact in the equilibrium. Again, like my rock example, if you toss it in there, it's just sitting on the bottom. Um, really, the only way for a solid to interact like in a reaction or a solution is for it to dissolve, which means it's no longer a solid. It then would become aqueous, right, which then would be included. Um, so we don't do solids, like I said earlier, and liquids, which means if we were to write the expression for this, this would be our KP expression, partial pressure of CO2. It's a little muddled here, but basically we wouldn't include any of those guys because they are solids. And our KC would be the concentration of CO2, nothing obviously on the reactant side since they are all solid in that particular case. Any questions on that? Now, what happens if you had maybe, I don't know, um, let's just say we had something where it was aqueous, for example goes to a product that ends up being a solid. How would we write the equilibrium? Let's just say this is A, or 2A, goes to mystery B over here. The equilibrium expression would be one over A, yeah, squared? So you just do one over it. If obviously there's some, nothing on the product side that would be included in the equilibrium expression, one over the reactants is sort of how you would sort of write that expression. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah, so if you happen to come across a, an equilibrium uh, reaction there, a reversible reaction where pretty much maybe you got all solids on the product side, maybe you got all liquids or something like that, and, but you do have something that would be included on the reactant side, 
you would do one over the reactants basically and just use the one sort of to indicate that obviously it's the numerator and the reactants there would still be our denominator. Other questions? <clears throat> And that's sort of what we see here, you know, again, with our solids here, our calcium carbonate and calcium oxide, again, not really participating with the CO2 as it's flying around causing pressure. Again, the only way for these guys really to participate is they would have to either become gases or aqueous guys to really be moving around, really be sort of actively participating. And again, our pure liquids, as we talked about in the previous uh, slides as well, you know, its concentration remains relatively constant um, compared to everything else. It doesn't really change overall. So it really is in a sense, not participating as well. Question, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's sort of hard. It's, it's hard to sort of show the visual for that because uh, for example, if you threw a bunch of solutions into a beaker, right? It's gonna look like water, right? And if you put water in there, it's still gonna kind of look like water, but the water molecules are basically covalently bonded, right? And there's a lot of them, right? And like I said before, every time you put a solution in that's sort of aqueous based, it also has more water basically is what you're adding for the most part. So there is just a, a ton of water molecules basically in there. And overall, it's overall concentration is really not changing very much as the process goes. It's really when you think about, you know, things reacting, you know, if you just had like, say a, a simple precipitation reaction where you throw some sodium chloride in with like silver nitrate, for example, right? It's, even though these are all water-based solution, it's really not the water part of it that's sort of reacting, right? It's like the sodium ions that are floating around, the chloride ions that are floating around, it's the silver, ions flowing around and it's like the nitrate ions and it's really these guys coming together right to make like a precipitate and stuff like that so you know it's really those aqueous sort of ions and solution that really are actively moving around and participating it's really those gas molecules obviously just by being a gas they're constantly flying around they got plenty of energy right so they're constantly sort of interacting in the equilibrium but something like water which again even in this beaker there's a ton of water that's basically in there, right? A water surrounding all those ions, right? That's how it dissolves, right? And how you make a solution is basically water goes and surrounds all the ions. Positive side of water, which is which side? The part of water is positive. Uh, hydrogen side, yeah. Oxygen more negative, right? Polar molecule, yeah dipole moment heading in this direction, yes. Um, so the oxygen side, you know, will surround the positive ions when it goes in solution, like the silver in this example, or the sodium, and a lot of them, right? Which is why it disappears. It looks like it kind of disappears when you dissolve something in it. The hydrogen part will surround, you know, the negative guys like chloride and nitrate, and a lot of them surround it, which again is why visually you can't see those things when you take something like salt and dissolve it in water, it gets surrounded by so much water, that is no longer visible to you to be able to see it. It's still there, right? Because we evaporate off the water, we get the salt back, right? If you've ever done that experiment. But because there's just so much water and with every aqueous guy and pure water, just water plenty, and it really doesn't change overall. So visually it would just look like a solution basically, you know, but it has water. Also, you know, if you remember, there's really sort of <clears throat> three three reasons why we have sort of chemical reactions take place, right? It's the formation of a solid, a precipitate. There's the electron transfer. And the third one is the formation of water, which is very hard to see, right? If you mix an acid and base, you just made water, but you can't visually see it, you know, in the beaker and stuff like that, yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, one last one here. The partial pressures for each gas is 0.265 atmospheres. Calculate our Kp and Kc at 295. Then end, why don't you finish up that one? We'll start with it on Tuesday. Make sure everybody's on the same page and we'll lay it up there, I think, for today.